Hey, welcome to the Macromolecules screencast. Um, this you should be watching in lieu of actual lecture. Um, so we're going to have a, an activity over this, um, but you want to make sure to also revisit this screencast um, when you are studying or take notes on it so you still get all of this stuff. Um, so we're talking about macromolecules. By macro, we just mean large. Um, I don't know exactly where molecules go from regular to macro, but somewhere in between a water molecule and this giant protein is the difference between a regular molecule and a macro molecule. I'm not even sure if I got the scale exactly right, but they are generally, you know, thousands of times bigger than individual uh, atoms or even small molecules like water, CO2, oxygen, that sort of thing. Um, advance. advance. There we go. All right, so we are going to have four different types of macromolecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. For each one, as it says down here, you want to um, know, you're not going to be describing because I'm not doing essay questions, um, what the monomers of each macromolecule are, so the small subunits, and then what the polymers are, so how the smaller subunits are put together to make the larger proteins, and then be able to identify, if I show you a picture, both the monomer and the polymer, or different examples of all of the macromolecules. And then you also want to be able to describe or state no, I should say, uh, the major function for the body for each different type of macromolecule we cover. So we are starting with carbohydrates. They're called carbohydrates because they are, consist mostly of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Um, the monomer that we care about is called a monosaccharide. The only monosaccharide that we care about is glucose. There are other biologically relevant monosaccharides, but we don't have time to cover all of them. Uh, monosaccharides, because they are small and they have these little polar side groups here, uh, like, can I draw? Where are we? This OH group right there and that OH group there. All of these OHs, those are polar. Um, so these molecules, because they're polar, can dissolve in water like glucose and sucrose and all of your sugars. Um, what we want to know about them is, well, one, you want to be able to identify glucose if you see it again and just say that that is glucose. And then you want to know that this is the molecules that your cells break down for energy. This is the preferred cellular energy source. So when we cover respiration, or how uh, carbohydrates are broken down to make energy in your mitochondria, it is glucose that your cells are going to start with. So you want to think of glucose as the highly refined gasoline that is going into the engine that is your cells. Uh, then this is just some examples of monosaccharides. Really, glucose here is the only one that we care about. Uh, there's your friend fructose, as in high fructose corn syrup, right? So it's it's still a sugar, it's sweet. Um, and then deoxyribose and ribose we're going to see in our DNA and RNA, the deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid. Um, disaccharides, I am never going to ask you about a disaccharide. It is still fun to be familiar with them. Um, here is sucrose. Sucrose is, yeah, I think I had it right, um, a glucose and a fructose disaccharide. Uh, then you have lactose, otherwise known as milk sugar, and maltose. And I don't know where maltose shows up in the natural world, uh, but the dimer to glucose is put together is a maltose. Um, then if you take a whole bunch of glucose molecules and you connect them together in a specific fashion, you make a polysaccharide or polymer of glucose that is called glycogen. This is the only polysaccharide that we care about. Um, 
and you want to know that it is your body's short-term energy storage molecule. And you want to think of it, as this says here, as your daily energy budget. And if we're still talking about fuel, right, um, glucose is the gasoline that is in your engine being burnt, and your fuel tank, which is how much gas you have to get you through the next couple of hours, that's your glycogen. That's how much fuel you can carry around with you that is readily burned. This we are just, we're going to skip this. We already talked about dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis reactions in the beginning of the chapter, but you do want to remember, or I should reiterate, um, this is how uh, polymers of, how should I put it? Can't speak today. Uh, this is how your carbohydrate polymers are put, to, put together to make uh, glycogen, and it's also how amino acids are polymerized. Um, so you have different reactants when you're making proteins versus making polysaccharides, but the reaction mechanism is the same. Linking them together is dehydration synthesis, breaking them apart is hydrolysis. So this here, the dehydration synthesis, is what happens in all of your tissues when you're building molecules, and hydrolysis is what happens in your digestive system when you're breaking down all of the food that you've eaten. This is why digestive enzymes are sometimes referred to as hydrolytic enzymes, because they perform hydrolysis reactions. Next up is lipids. There are actually three different kinds of lipids. Um, oils or fats, cholesterol and phospholipid, um, they are all lumped together as lipids because they have similar properties in regards to water, that is they are all hydrophobic. Um, oils and phospholipids you will see are structurally similar to one another, cholesterol is not structurally similar to either of the other lipids. So we are starting with your fats or oils which are called triglycerides. So it doesn't matter whether this is solid animal fat, like that you would trim off of a steak, or a uh, plant fat, like olive oil, canola oil, vegetable oil, um, coconut oil, which is kind of in between, right? Um, this is what all of your fats and oils look like. They are called triglycerides because they start with this molecule here, which is called glycerol. So this is called the glycerol head group. And then to that is added three fatty acid tails, or hydrocarbon tails. And this is also a dehydration synthesis reaction. So they're not really polymers, but they're still parts that are stuck together through dehydration synthesis. Um, so if you see something that looks like this, you want to be able to identify that as a triglyceride. Um, who cares about this? We're going to skip it. Uh, we don't really have time to do saturated versus unsaturated, and I don't think I asked you about it on the exam. So next up, then, triglyceride function. Uh, they do do a lot of other things. As it says here, they help absorb lipid-soluble vitamins. Um, this is why it's really not a bad idea to put a little bit of oil of some sort on your salad as part of your salad dressing. If you're doing it right, it's olive oil with balsamic vinegar. There really is no better way to dress a salad, in my opinion. Uh, then your body also uses lipids or fat as thermal insulation and shock absorption. So you have fat pads around your heart to protect it, um, fat pads by your kidneys and around your eyes, so that as your body bounces around, these sensitive organs don't bounce around as much. Now the simplest, easiest thing to remember and the one that we are going to focus on that I am most likely to ask you about is that triglycerides are your long-term energy storage. Um, so this is if you have eaten a lot in one day and you're not exercising a lot, right? you're not burning through all of your glycogen, you've got excess calories in your energy budget. Those excess calories get stored as fat. And if you go back and look here at the structure, right, fat is also kind of a carbohydrate, right? It's carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So chemically, it's not very hard 
to convert these fatty acid or hydrocarbon tails into a chemical form that your mitochondria can then break down into CO2 and water and use to make what your cells like, which is ATP. Um, all right, where were we? So we did that. Phospholipids is next. These you will notice look a lot like your triglycerides. So it's still in the middle, that same glycerol head group, but now there are only two fatty acid tails. And instead of a third fatty acid tail, this phosphate containing head group is added. I apologize that these slides are a little bit fuzzy. Um, I figured out about halfway through the semester why they were becoming fuzzy, um, but I didn't get around to fixing all of them, but it has something to do with how the files get decompressed, and I wasn't managing my files properly. Uh, at any rate, phospholipids, uh, glycerol head group, two fatty acid tails, one phosphate containing head group. Um, if you were able to see it better, that one's not clear either, um, you would see that this phosphate containing head group, here's a little negative here. Oh, whoops, I'm writing on the wrong thing. Here's a negative there, and that N has a little positive on it. Um, there are charges on this head group. It is polar. So you have a molecule with one polar end and one nonpolar end, which means you have a molecule that has one hydrophilic end that can hydrogen bond with water and one hydrophobic end. Now, this is why phospholipids are used as the primary ingredient in all of your cell membranes. And this is true across all life form, um, plants, animals, algae, um, there are life forms that have um, capsules, uh, proteins and carbohydrate capsules, also in addition to the cell membrane, but everything that is alive has a phospholipid bilayer as its cell membrane. So if you look at what you have here, um, this is supposed to be the inside of the cell. Inside of the cell is a watery or aqueous solution. So these phospholipids are oriented with the polar phosphate group facing the inside of the cell where there's water and these phosphate groups are hydrogen bonding with the water so everybody's happy because everybody can hydrogen bond and then outside of all of your cells right if you are inside of the body you are surrounded by water so maybe there's plasma or interstitial fluid out here it doesn't matter what it is all of the extracellular spaces are also filled with water. So here you have another layer of phospholipids with the heads oriented towards the watery solution outside the cell and the tails stuck in the middle of the membrane. So you have this little hydrophobic barrier with hydrophilic surfaces on either side of it that separates the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell. And you're going to see when we get to talking about cells, the, what's the word I'm looking for, the set point for what can cross a cell and what can't cross a cell starts with what can and what cannot cross through the phospholipid bilayer. Then when transport proteins get into the mix, things get a little bit more complicated. Um, but theoretically, that's where we start is with our phospholipid bilayer. So it's very important to remember that. Then you have cholesterol. This is what cholesterol looks like. Um, it is a ring structure. You do not know this, but these rings are very good at sharing electrons. So electrons kind of just float amongst all of the carbons that are connected together in this ring, which makes them really hydrophobic. They are extremely non-polar. Even though there's an OH here, that is not enough of a polarity to make this molecule remotely soluble in water. So cholesterol is very hydrophobic because these rings are very good at spreading out all the electrons so that you don't get polarity. Uh, cholesterol does two important things that we are going to function on, focus on. One, it is the precursor as this says here, for all of your steroid hormones. 
So your steroid hormones are by definition those hormones that are derived from cholesterol. Um, usually we think when somebody says steroids, you think great big bodybuilder, mixed martial artist, something like that. Those are specifically anabolic steroids um, that cause your body to get bigger, um, but there are plenty of other steroids that don't have anything to do with adding mass. Um, cortisol helps you manage stress. Corticosterone is related to it. Aldosterone helps you manage your sodium levels. And then you have progesterone and estrogen, which are female reproductive hormones. Um, they do affect growth and maturation, but they don't add muscle mass the way testosterone does. Next up, Cholesterol is also a minor component of cell membrane. So there's a little bit of it here and a little bit of it there and a little bit of it there. Um, as I, I always get this wrong, um, but depending on how much cholesterol is in your membrane, you either have a softer, more fluid membrane or a stiffer, less fluid membrane. Uh, and I want to say that it's the cholesterol that allows it to be more fluid. It kind of breaks up some of the interactions between the fatty acid tails so everything in the membrane moves around a little bit more. So those fish that you find in colder waters have more cholesterol in their membrane so that their membranes don't harden right? the way olive oil would if you put it in the freezer. So it's a Adjusting the cholesterol is a way of keeping membranes fluid when animals live in colder conditions. Next up is proteins. Proteins are awesome um, because they do all the doing in your body, as we will see. Um, so the monomer of proteins is amino acid. We will go over the amino acid structure in a moment. When you string a bunch of amino acids together, we call that a polypeptide. In its mature state, we call it a protein, but for now, let's just say the polymer is a polypeptide. That is a series of amino acids held together by a special bond called a peptide bond. You don't need to understand that, but you should recognize that word. This is an amino acid. Um, so all of them share a very similar structure or the same kind of structure, wherein you have a central or alpha carbon each of the alpha carbons will have a hydrogen, a carboxylic acid group, and an amino group. So this is where amino acid comes from. And then each of your different amino acids will have a different fourth substitute on the central carbon or R group. And it's the R group that makes each amino acid different. And it's the collection of all of the different amino acids and the interactions with those amino acids and themselves that give the protein its shape and its function. Just to give you an example of some different structures, uh, this is glycine. Glycine is the smallest of all of the amino acids. Its R group is just a hydrogen. Um, so you're gonna find glycine in parts of protein structure where the polypeptide backbone makes a sharp turn. So it gets tucked into small places. Aspartic acid actually acts as an acid even when it's incorporated into the polypeptide. Um, so like if I skip ahead here, right, when you form the peptide bond here, um, this OH and this H go away, right? It's a dehydration synthesis. Um, you're dehydrating these molecules, you're forming water. Um, so this carboxylic acid group isn't really functioning as an acid when it's part of a peptide chain because it's lost its OH group. It's just this carbon bonded to this nitrogen. But if you have an R group like here with carboxylic acid hanging off the side, now this carboxylic acid group, if this, um, if this amino acid finds itself, let's say in a basic solution where there aren't a lot of hydrogen ions, it can let go of that hydrogen ion and decrease the pH of that solution. Lysine is referred to, you can see right here, as a basic amino acid because this amino group, which again, now it's part of the I group, it's not um, bound up in the middle of a peptide bond 
like this amino group is here, uh, this nitrogen right here under the right conditions can absorb a hydrogen ion. Um, it will take on a positive charge, but it can just absorb a third hydrogen ion and reduce the number of hydrogen ions in the solution, which is going to raise the pH. So you can have amino acid side groups as part of a protein that act as acids and bases. And cysteine here, we're just not going to talk about because we don't have time. Um, this is our friend, the peptide bond, which I really should have put up here. Um, sorry, you didn't see that, but I just moved this slide around in the slide order. Um, all right, then we get to levels of protein structure. They are primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. We will go over what they all mean. The final mature shape of a protein um, the shape that the protein has to have in order to perform its function is called the conformation. And we'll come back to that later. So first up, primary structure is just simply the sequence of amino acids. You don't even need a picture to see it. You can just list them off. Um, and we can't read them here because the image is blurry. Secondary structure is, as this says here, I just added this, shapes taken on by small sections of peptide chain. They are sometimes referred to as local structure. Um, two examples of secondary structures are an alpha helix and a beta pleated sheet. So if we look at this protein down here, or I should say this is a peptide, is a strand of amino acids. Um, this is the beginning of it, and you're following um, the carbon carbon nitrogen backbone here it's this is sort of what is called random coil when it looks like that then you get into here's an alpha helix then random coil another alpha helix this is what looks like a beta pleated sheet coil well coil helix sheet 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 a um, whole bunch of other stuff so you can see you have one long peptide that different regions have formed different secondary structures like these beta pleated sheets and these alpha helices. Um, and these are structures that get repeated in different proteins and different places on the same protein to give it function. So if two proteins are going to stick to each other, um, or if something is going to stick to a protein, um, like you are a neurotransmitter receptor, the binding pocket that the neurotransmitter is going to stick to is usually a series of beta pleated sheets because they make depressions and surfaces that stuff can stick to. And if a protein is going to try and stick to something else, quite often it's an alpha helix that is used and gets wedged into some sort of crevice on something like, say, DNA. Um, so at the molecular level, we can see structure and function are tied together even when you're looking at proteins. So molecular biologists or protein biologists can look at a protein structure not knowing really anything about the protein and make some guesses about what it can do or what it does based on its secondary structure or its overall conformation. So then, this is the same protein from the last slide, tertiary structure is the final overall shape that a single strand of amino acids would take. So it's all the alpha helices, the beta pleated sheets, and the random coil portions of a peptide. If this peptide in its tertiary structure performs the function that the body needs it to perform, if it is mature, then this is the conformation, the final shape of this protein. Yeah. Some proteins have more than one polypeptide stuck together. Uh, this is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is made of four polypeptides that all get stuck together to make one really, really big molecule. So the final conformation of hemoglobin includes quaternary structure because it's a combination of multiple polypeptides. So its final conformation has quaternary structure 
where other smaller proteins, their final conformation might only have um, tertiary structure. Um, so protein function, boy, proteins do a lot of different things. Um, we can't cover all of them, um, but right, they, it can be structural, like your hair has a lot of protein. Uh, proteins can be motors, like they actually move uh, and generate mechanical force. So you have proteins in your muscles that shuffle stuff around, and that's what causes your muscles to generate force. Um, they can act like receptors. Um, here we go. Best example would be a taste bud, right? Sugar hits your tongue. There's a protein that the sugar sticks to, and that causes stuff to happen inside of a cell that ends up stimulating your immune system immune, excuse me, nervous system. Um, we're going to focus on proteins as enzymes because it is one of the most important central function that proteins perform. Um, enzymes you want to think of as catalysts that are made out of protein. So catalysts increase the rate of, what's the word I'm looking for, chemical reactions, but are not consumed in the chemical reaction and they do so by lowering what's called the activation energy. Um, so a lot of times with enzymes, if you're going to create something new, you have to break up an old molecule. So you break old bonds so you can make new bonds. The energy required to break the old bonds is the activation energy. Here's one example of activation energy. Um, so the enzymes just lower the activation energy. Uh, make it easier for the reaction to take place. And if it's easier to take place, if there's less energy input needed, then it's going to happen a lot faster. Um, what do we care? Oh, and then so there's some terminology we have to go over. And I should slow down just a little bit here um, because understanding enzymes is important. Um, and we will revisit this when we get to anatomy and physiology too, because it's enzymes that digest all of your food. Um, so the two reactants in the chemical reaction that are interacting with one another and the enzyme are called substrates. What is produced on the other side is called product. That should be over here. Um, right, so if A and B are going to get together to form AB, and an enzyme is going to help that happen, then A and B are the substrates that interact with the enzyme. You get AB as the product, and you get your enzyme back. So it speeds up the chemical reaction, but it is neither altered or consumed in the chemical reaction. Enzymes usually end in ACE, so a protease would do the exact opposite of this. It would break peptide bonds and digest proteins. Um, the region, sorry, I'm gonna talk about this word right here, but I want this picture. Um, I think I need to rearrange this slide and put this text with these images. Um, but it's a new, new set of slides I got last year and I haven't made them perfect yet, right? So again, um, if this was A, B, it's just like this reaction here where you have two small things get put together to make a big thing. So here's your enzyme. This is the active site. Um, a and B fit in the active site in such a way that they are aligned in a position that makes it more likely that they're going to stick together. This is one of the things that enzymes do is just provide a surface that things like to stick to, and that then brings things together in the proper orientation to encourage a chemical reaction to take place. So substrates stick to the active site, catalysis takes place, the product is released, and you get your enzyme back with the active site still intact. Um, just to give you an example of how important enzymes are, um, this is a poster um, which I found somewhere on a Creative Commons website, so I'm not violating copyright. Um, if you look here, this is just all a bunch of different biochemical reactions. So all of the black arrows are chemical reactions, and everything that you see here written in blue 
every one of those blue words is an enzyme that's catalyzing that reaction. So if you zoom way out, right, there's a whole ton of blue in that hugely complicated picture. So really what your enzymes do is control pretty much all of your body's chemistry. It would be like, imagine a city with no traffic lights. That is what your biochemistry would be like, right? It would be gridlock, nothing would get anywhere, um, nothing would get done when it's supposed to, um, but enzymes make sure that all of the chemical reactions that have to happen to promote homeostasis happen where they're supposed to happen and when they're supposed to happen. Um, and this is just some examples which I will not go into because it's really just too many things. Um, but yeah, every most of what needs to be done inside of your cells is done by enzymes. Um, so synthesizing things like hormones, DNA, um, taking glucose and making glycogen, that's all done by enzymes. If you're running out of energy and you need to break down your glycogen, that's done by enzymes. And taking glucose and breaking it apart to release the energy inside of it, which your body is going to store as ATP or trans uh, transform into ATP, that's all governed by enzymes. Protein synthesis, DNA synthesis, everything is regulated by enzymes. So they do all of the work. Um, this, I think we're going to skip. Um, but we do want to understand one thing um, in that, right, enzymes are proteins. Proteins have conformation. So an active enzyme in its proper conformation will have its active site intact, and an inactive enzyme will have its active site not intact. And this is how your body controls the activity of enzymes by controlling the shape of the protein. And we don't have time to get into how, but we just want to know that that's a thing that happens. Um, so protein denaturation, um, is when you lose the conformation of the protein. It loses its shape. Um, and because structure and function are tied together, even at the molecular level, if a protein does not have the right shape, it is not going to be able to perform its function. So if you denature an enzyme, you're going to disrupt the active site. Now, the two most common ways to denature proteins is through... Uh, changes or extremes in pH. Um, so very high pH, very low pH can cause a protein to denature, and changes in temperature or excess heat. And what the heat really does, heat on a molecular level, is molecules moving around a lot. If you have a structure like this and you put a lot of heat into it, all the parts of it start vibrating and it basically shakes itself apart because there are all sorts of weak, hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions um, and uh, hydrogen bonding interactions that hold the protein in this shape. And if you pump a lot of heat into it and make it want to move around, all of those small forces that hold the protein together end up um, being broken. It's just not enough force to hold the protein together, um, and the heat just causes it to fall apart. What the pH does, just because I feel like talking about it, is if we go back here, remember we were talking about um, these two amino acid side groups can either let go of a hydrogen ion or absorb a hydrogen ion. When that reaction happens, all right, if this lets go of a hydrogen ion, it becomes positive. So it went from kind of polar to really polar. This is pretty much a nonpolar side group right here. If it picks up an extra hydrogen, because it's now in an acidic solution, it becomes NH3+. Now something that was once hydrophobic becomes hydrophilic. Um, so when you expose a protein like this to big changes in pH, um, things that are positive become negative, things that were negative become, well, not in a positive, become negative. Um, Things that were once polar can become nonpolar, 
and amino acid side groups that were once nonpolar can become polar. That changes the charge distribution on the protein, and it basically turns itself inside out because all of its hydrophilic, hydrophobic interactions have been turned on their heads. Uh, this is why you can cook delicate meats like seafood in acid. If you've ever had ceviche, um, that's usually shrimp or other seafood. If it's really good ceviche, there's a little bit of squid and maybe some sea bass in there. Um, but uh, that's why you can cook delicate meats in lime juice or lemon juice because the acidity in the juice denatures the proteins. Um, sorry, I know TMI, but whatever, we're still going fast because there's no time for questions in the screencast. So next up is nucleic acids. Uh, their structure is a little bit more complicated. Um, we are going to think of the nucleotide as being the basic building block of a nucleic acid. But we also want to remember that a nucleotide contains a sugar, a phosphate, and a base. So this is what the adenine dinucleotide would look like. Actually, a mononucleotide, excuse me. Would, mono just means it's got one phosphate on it. Um, so this is adenine monophosphate nucleotide. So if on the exam you see something that looks like this, you want to be able to say that is a nucleotide. Um, and I should also say, remember, right, we didn't talk about it, but if you see something that looks like that, say that that is a protein. Uh, I am not going to show you pictures of secondary structure. You just want to know what secondary structure looks like, um, what, or excuse me, what secondary structure is, the definitions. Um, the picture I will show you will look something like this, um, what is called like the ribbon model of protein structure. Sorry, moving right along. Um, so if you take a strand of nucleotides or a group of nucleotides and string them together, that is a nucleic acid. Um, and I think it's this phosphate head group that can act like an acid. Um, before it's in solution, it has some hydrogens on it, so it's kind of like phosphoric acid, and then you dump it in solution, and ba-boom, it's a nucleic acid. Um, so you want to be able to tell the difference between deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, and ribonucleic acid, RNA. Um, I am not going to go into a lot of detail on this structure here because you are going to forget it, and I don't like this picture very much. Um, but when we talk about DNA synthesis again in Chapter 3, the structure will become important. So the two important things I want you to know about DNA, uh, DNA structure. One, deoxyribo means it has the deoxyribose sugar, right? And it is, this picture makes it a little bit easier to see, right? Two strands, here's one strand, here's another strand, um, in what is called a double helix shape. So it is helical in that it spirals, and there are two strands stuck together that spiral, so we call it a double helix. The one thing I want you to remember about the strands is that they're oriented in the opposite direction. So if we just look down here, here's one strand. This is our what is called the sugar phosphate backbone. It goes sugar, phosphate, excuse me. Yeah, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. So the end of this strand ends in a sugar, the end of that strand ends in a phosphate. So they have directionality to them. Um, so you want to be able to recognize if you see something like this, this is DNA. I will not show you this on the exam because that would be mean. This is just there to show you that the two ends are different. So sugar here, phosphate there. If we look at the other end, this one is phosphate here and sugar there. Um, all right, then you have ribonucleic acid or RNA. There are two major differences between DNA and RNA. First is the sugar involved. In DNA, it is a deoxyribose sugar. In RNA, it is a ribose sugar. That is not an important distinction. The big distinction is that RNA is single-stranded and DNA is double-stranded. 
And I also forgot to go over the functions. Um, so if we go back to DNA, um, DNA is what your genes are made out of. Um, so the information needed to put together all of the proteins that do all of the work for your cells is encoded in the basis of your DNA. Um, so if you look at the phosphate backbone, it's just phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. There's no way to encode that. It's the same alternating structure the whole way through it. But the bases, you have four different bases, and depending on what the sequence of bases are, that is where the information needed to assemble amino acids is stored. So the code of your genetic code is located in the bases, the nitrogenous bases of your DNA double helix. And then what RNA is, is just a single-stranded version of the same code. Um, so you still have the same nitrogenous bases, with the exception with uh, RNA, you have uracil, which gets substituted for thymine in your DNA. So DNA is AGCT, um, and RNA is AGCU. Uh, then, how many we have? This is our last slide. Uh, we have the special molecule. It's not even really a macromolecule, um, but it is related in structure to DNA and RNA because it is adenosine triphosphate. It is basically your adenine nucleotide with three phosphates on it now instead of just the one. I'm going to start talking about what it does by talking about how it's made. Um, so we said that your cells like to burn glucose, which is true, right? But you can eat fat, you can eat protein, you can eat carbs. Um, all of these different macromolecules are shuttled into some sort of biochemical pathway that ends up converting them into ATP. So what ATP is, if you look on the second line here, is a universal battery for all of your energy requiring machinery inside of a cell. Um, this is not as big of a, this does not sound like as big of a deal as it used to, um, but back in the day before everything was rechargeable, right, everything took a different size battery. You might have double A, triple A batteries for your remote control, D cell batteries for your flashlight, that weird 9 volt rectangular battery which is still in your what are those things called fire alarms um, so you might have had four or five different kinds of batteries that you had to stock to keep all of your electronics functioning properly the way it works in your cells is that nature has decided well not decided but it has turned out um, because it is simpler and more efficient that ATP is the battery that powers energy, ener energy requiring process that goes on inside of a cell. And it just makes it simple. So you have a central sort of power conversion plant, your mitochondria, that takes all of the different kinds of energy that you can pump into a cell and then converts it all into ATP. Um, so the ATP can float around everywhere and give energy wherever energy is needed, and you don't have to have um, energy producing machinery adjacent to every energy requiring part of the cell. It makes things much more efficient. Um, so ATP is really like the energy currency inside of a cell. That is what powers on the molecular level almost all of the energy requiring processes or reactions that happen inside of a cell. Okay, that is 45 minutes. That is not bad. Um, thank you for sticking through to the end. Hopefully you took a couple of breaks because 45 minutes straight on a screencast is a long time.